the book of James chapter 4 verses 13 through 15 the fourth chapter of the book of James the 13th through the 15th verses the New King James Version. We shall find these words. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Amen. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us for this time and for this place. For you manage time meticulously right down to the millisecond. You know just how to order our steps in the Lord that we may be in sync with God. As we yield our hearts and minds and undivided attention to you, Holy Spirit, may you minister to us in a way that nobody else but the Holy Spirit can. Because you can reach a place in us. You can touch our hearts and minds and souls in places that no one can reach but the hand of God. And so God, we need that touch in the places where medicine can't reach, where psychologists and psychiatrists can't reach. We need you to touch us where human wisdom cannot go. You know us better than we know ourselves. Let your word, which is alive, penetrate and operate between the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow of the bone, that we may bring forth fruit unto eternity. In Jesus' name, we receive it by faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, Amen. for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord will, Amen. we shall live and do this or that. Let us reason together briefly from this subject. Abbreviations. Abbreviations. Will you repeat that after me? Abbreviations. Thanks be unto God. 
But the Lord has invested within our spiritual bank account the rich and inspiring words of the book of James. For in reading this unique passage of scripture in the book of James, we find the pastor sobering us with the reality of the revelation of God. He has to speak a word to us where we live. He has to speak to our goals and aspirations. He has to speak to our attentiveness to the bottom line, to the profit motive, to the American dream. The apostle has to talk with us about our expectations of life. How that each one of us really want to do better. Right. We want to help our children to do better. We want to send them to better schools in the hope of them getting better jobs. We want increase for our lives and that is why the apostle addresses the fact that sometimes we put everything at risk trying to make a profit. It is as though he has America in mind. <laughs> Go ahead, Bishop. When he addresses the boastfulness of a mentality that comes from Wall Street, where every day we find stocks being traded, designed to make not just a profit, but a killing. We find individuals who are so wrapped up in the wide fluctuations of this economic center of the world that each day fortunes are being gained and lost. We are not forgetful of the fact that in America it is said 1% of this country owns over 80% of the wealth. And whenever you concentrate that much money and power in such a small minority of people, it is no accident that the rich, for some reason, keep getting richer. And even after having worked two and three jobs just to try to make ends meet, the poor keep getting poorer. The middle class is being squeezed. And even organizations that were visible, that we thought were strong businesses, either are on strike or talking about striking. Yes, this pastor addresses us where we live, where we bank, where we invest, where we work, where we struggle, even where we gamble. Listen to him sobering us by saying, come on now. It is as though you are daring God. Amen. When you say that we got this in the bag, we're going to plant this business, we're going to build this facility or engage in this venture, and we know we're going to make a profit by any means necessary. The word of God warns us in Psalm 37, fret not yourself because of the individuals who prosper in their own schemes. Amen. Amen. There are so many get-rich-quick schemes. There are so many individuals whose only design is to take advantage of the poor. 
We see these policies in place day in and day out and we don't have to go far to find them because we know that nobody will allow abandoned factory buildings to sit there for decades in certain affluent suburban communities. Amen. But in the communities where we live and work, nothing is said or done by buildings that have been in ruin for years. I'm glad that this preacher talks about it from the pulpit because there are some things that cannot be ignored from the pulpit. You can't just turn and look the other way when you know that every day people are literally being blown to pieces in our streets. Guns flooding into our community and there is no outrage. We have become insensitive to it. We expect it. It is as though we're looking for what the headline is going to say about what teenager has been killed, what carjacking, what drunk driver, what atrocity has taken place. Why is there no outrage about the injustice in our society and community? No wonder Jeremiah says, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I may weep for the slain of my people. And I don't expect politicians who are in bed with the National Rifle Association to be outraged. I don't expect people who are being paid wined and dined even on the Supreme Court by multiple billionaires. I don't expect you to have a conscience because they've already bought you and got the receipts to show for it. But I do believe that in the kingdom of God, there ought to be some outrage. There ought to be some concern. Somebody ought to open your mouth, cry loud, stand up, lift up your voice like a trumpet, speak out against injustice. And that is why there's something different about the book of James, because he is referred to as the prophet of justice in the New Testament. You don't find many other preachers addressing the issues that James does. Who else but James calls the rich men out in this book and says, How you rich men cry, weep, because you know that you have defrauded the poor. You know that you have taken advantage of them for generations. He has the nerve to say, How you rich men, because God is coming after you. Oh, I would advise you when you go home to just take your time and read the book of James. Because if you read this book, you will find yourself being stirred in your heart about the conditions that we must face as a people. It is no accident that we find individuals who want to ban books that talk about our experience as African Americans in this country. Amen. The Secretary of Education of the state of Oklahoma when being asked if we are not to discuss the issues of racism, how can we talk about what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the massacre that killed over 300 African Americans when Black Wall Street, which was one of the most prosperous communities of any color in America, was literally bombed and burned to ashes. And the white Secretary of Education said, well, you talk about it, but you don't mention anybody's color. You just deal with their actions and their character. Your head is in the sand. You are an ostrich. And it's an awkward sight to see an ostrich with a great big behind, a long neck, and your head is in the sand. 
How dare you to try to shut my mouth about what we have experienced as a people in America. And that's one of the reasons why such violence happens in our community because we have become so detached and isolated from our legacy, our history, our identity that we want to be like other folk even if it means taking a gun and taking somebody else's car that you never worked for or stealing from somebody's store or even robbing from the poor. You don't even know how to be a good thief. You robbing from broke people and other man puts on a necktie and a suit and gets billions of dollars on his computer. You're not even a good thief. Where is the outrage? That's what the Apostle James is wondering. Why is it that there is no one who has the intestinal fortitude to address these issues? Yes, people may wonder, why are you saying that anyway? What gives you the right to preach this sermon, to address these issues? You don't get any better credentials than his even though there are some individuals who are jealous of his ecclesiastical ascendancy. And wherever you are in the Lord, you didn't get there overnight. God does not have any overnight successes. He doesn't have any instant wonders. So if you come to any one of us and ask us what you doing there or how did you get there, you just as well get ready for testimony because God brought me not just from a mighty long ways, but brought me all the way. And for me, personally, all the way means from the other side of scratch. Now you may not be able to say, man, did they just say, hmm. Why don't you just ask somebody in case they don't know, ask them, what is from the other side of scratch? Nothing. Nothing. Well, let, let's talk about that. Have you ever heard people say, you got to bake a cake from scratch but if you ain't got nothing to scratch or to scratch with that means you gotta go somewhere and find some bacon powder you gotta find some butter you gotta find some confection is sugar. If you got to go from the other side of scratch, you might even have to find or borrow a stove. You can't bake no cake and you're homeless. You can't bake no cake. You ain't even got a stove. How you going to bake a cake and you ain't got nothing? You starting from the other side of scratch. And I'm glad God will meet you on the other side of scratch. And it seemed like you got nothing, no friends, no government programs, no incentives. Even folk that say they love God don't want to talk to you. And yet God will show up on the other side of scratch and let you know life is still worth living. Why don't you help me with it? Come on, look at somebody and tell them life is still worth living. Come on, help me give God some praise on that. Jesus lives. And because I know that Jesus lives, my life is worth living. James gets it right because he has learned even though he wasn't in the classroom, he learned even though he was never where Jesus could enroll him in kingdom ministry. He still learned even though he never walked with the other apostles, never heard Jesus preach, never saw Jesus work a miracle, was not there when he was crucified, buried, or resurrected, was not there on the day of Pentecost. Yet, 
he learned. Amen. How is it that James learned anything from Jesus when he never attended church, never attended a crusade, never saw Jesus in ministry? How is it that you can rise to being the pastor of the church that Jesus is building? How is it that you can become the first bishop of Jerusalem who convened the first church council in AD 51 that addressed racism in the church? How did you get there and you were never in class, you never heard Jesus preach, you never saw him work in the ministry, but you still mysteriously rose to the top. Yeah, that, that's worth asking. I don't mind you asking that question because it might make you wonder. It's not nepotism. This just happened to be the brother of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not stuck on his brothers. He couldn't be because they didn't follow him. They didn't believe in him. His own brothers in John chapter 7 said, if you such a wonder, why don't you go on up to Jerusalem? What you doing around here? Jesus says, well, I can't go up until my time come. Your time has already come because you ain't doing nothing no way. So you always can do nothing. I have to wait until the Spirit of God gives me a door of utterance. I have to move in sync with the commandment of God. Jesus knew that I've got to preach even though my own mama is not a member of my church. I can't make my mother the church mother because she won't even come to my church. I can't make my brother one of the associate ministers because he doesn't even attend the service. I can't put my sisters over the choir or the ushers because they don't attend my services. And when I have church, they stand on the outside and send me notes on the inside as if to say, hurry up and get through, Jesus, because your family's out here, your mama out here. And you got to have some anointing to keep on ministering when your family is against you, when your family fights you. You get other folks saved and your own family has nothing to do with you. They don't want to lose their membership in the synagogue. And here you are, got two brothers. Andrew and Simon, who Jesus renamed Peter. You got two more brothers, James and John. You got two more brothers, Philip and Nathaniel. You even got Thomas, who is called Didymus, which means twin. How you got all these men who are brothers, who own businesses, who are entrepreneurs among your disciples, and you ain't got nobody from your family in this church? But some things God can do through you, dead or alive. And I'm glad that Jesus realized if I don't get them while I'm alive, I'll get them after I'm dead. After I hang on that cross, after I'm mutilated, after I'm publicly shamed and disgraced, after my body is out of joint and my disciples are so embarrassed by my public nakedness in the execution that they hide their faces from me after I'm in the grave and after I've gone to hell for three days and night, I'm coming out of there and I'm going to get my brothers, I'm going to get my mama, I'm going to get my sisters, I'm coming out of there and I'm going to get my family into the kingdom. I want you to know God can use you dead or alive. If you don't get your dreams fulfilled while you're living, God will come and get you after you're dead and let you know I'm not finished with you yet. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Their works do follow them. Yea, saith the Spirit. God can do some things through you that he couldn't do while you were living. King couldn't get a holiday name after him while he was living. Couldn't get his image on a postage stamp while he was living. But after he died, even folk that hated him had to honor him. I'm 
glad that God is never done with your life. Even when you stop breathing, there's enough left in you to still make an impact on somebody's life. I'm glad that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses that we can walk by faith and not by sight. When you can't get nothing from down here, look up. There's some praise in the grandstand. There's some glory in the grandstand. Somebody rooting for you in the grandstand. Look up. If God be for us, who can be against us? That is why this preacher that God came and got him, he's still angry with Jesus because of the jealousy in the family. Some of your worst problems don't come from your own family. Jesus says one's enemies, one's foes are in his own household. Jesus has to deal with the issues. I came from a good family. My daddy, Yahweh, the Holy Spirit, we are one. But to be a human means you got to wrestle with family issues. You got to wrestle with family struggle. The first murder took place in the family. A brother, Cain, kills Abel. Family means trouble. But God will help you even with family trouble. James recognizes that Jesus loves him so much that even after all these years have passed I have a calling on your life yes you thought I was just another brother I look like you work with you apprentice in the carpenter's shop but when I go about my public ministry at 30, I can't keep this back anymore. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning. And I know you can't take it right away, family. I know you can't handle it, mother. She had to ponder these things and hide them in her heart. Sometimes when your family doesn't embrace you, understand you, it takes time for them to grow up and deal with what God has placed in you. Joseph's own brothers couldn't stand him. He got too many visions, too many dreams. He think we're going to bow down to you will bow down to me. Not yet, but in God's own time, he will bring his plan into place. Amen. Yes, this writer has come of age as he writes to the church and deals with issues from across the spectrum and he can't help but talk about the most important issue of all which is life. If you don't have life, what else do you have to talk about? If you don't have life, what is there to discuss? What problem are you going to deal with if you don't even have life? Everything hinges upon the issue of life. And that is why Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life because you never had it before. The thief before I got to you, he'd already stolen from you. He's a thief that steals, kills, destroys. I come to give you spirit to spirit resuscitation. I come to give you your life back, give you your mind back, give you your future back, give you your destiny. I come to give you your identity back. I showed up, I came down from heaven so you could have the thing you ain't never had before. That's life. Thank God I have life. Let me hear somebody say life. No, no. Life is not just what happens when parents birth you into the world. That's existence. That's a heartbeat. That's a pulse. But until God moves into you, you ain't got no life. Until God lives in you, you're the walking dead. Until God abides in you, you're not alive yet. Jesus is keeping me alive not greens and cornbread not neck bones and pits over it's Jesus not money, not charge, not fame not glory Jesus is keeping
keeping me alive. Come on, help me give Jesus some praise. Jesus says, I'm coming so that you can have life. Who else knows more about life than Jesus? Jesus, what you got to say about life? I don't just have life, I am life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a life. And I know some people would tell you get a life, but no, don't get a life. Get the life. Even New York Insurance said that when the wrecking ball comes against your building and tears it down, New York says, that's life. And you understand that when the storms are raging, the winds are blowing, flood waters are rising and come to destroy you, that's life. Well, that's bio, but when I realize my house is built on a solid rock, that's Zoe. Zoe is the God kind of life. I need the life that can only come from God. Amen. Jesus doesn't come just to give you breath. Jesus comes to root you in an eternal identity. Because if you believe in me, you will live forever. I wish you would help me say, I'm going to live forever. Jesus put so much life in me that eventually I'm going to outgrow this clay house because I have a treasure in this earthen vessel. I have a treasure in this clay jar. And the treasure is immortal. The treasure cannot be destroyed by evil. The treasure is protected by the power of God, covered by the blood of Jesus, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And even when the life in me gets too big for my body, when I outgrow my body, when I outlive my house, that's when God said, I'm going to give you a moving date. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, if it gets too small, if it gets too weak, then God said, you've outgrown this house. I'm going to give you a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Jesus has put so much life in me that he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And even when you stop breathing, I know how to bring you back to life. I know how to raise you up. I know how to make you live better than you ever lived in your life. What is your life? Well, the apostle says, it's an abbreviation. Now, an abbreviation is a shortened form of a word or expression. Sometimes you don't want to write out Pennsylvania, so you just put PA. You don't want to spell out that you colored, so you just put in AACP instead of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Kentucky Fried Chicken found out fried food may not be the best for you, so we're going to stop telling you about fried, because we got baked food now. We got salads, we got mashed potatoes. We ain't gonna say fried no more. We gonna just say KFC. Abbreviations, you 
use the psychology of acronyms. AFL-CIO, the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, NFL, National Football League, ABC, American Broadcast Corporation, NBC, National Broadcasting Corporation, CNN, Cable News Network, CBS, Columbia Broadcasting Corporation, AFSCME, American Federation of State Council and Municipal Inflories, SAG, Screen Actors Guild, who own strike. United States Postal Service raised the price of a stamp to 66 cents. UPS, United Postal Service, said we might go on strike next month. <laughs> Abbreviation mean cut it short. And that's what James said happened to us when we sinned. We got abbreviated because God made us to live forever. He put a tree in the center of the garden called the tree of life. And if you eat that fruit of the tree of life, you never have cancer, you never have diabetes, you never have tuberculosis, you never have arthritis, rheumatism, if you just eat that fruit of the tree of life. But Satan said, you don't want that fruit, you want the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Life is a choice. You gotta want to live. You have to desire to live. You have to strive to live. Happiness is a choice. Salvation is a choice. Receiving the Holy Ghost is a choice. If you want to live, God will give you life. If you want to live, He'll rebuke death off your body. If you want to live, Jesus will give you life and that more abundantly. Thank you, Lord, for offering us life. Even so, Adam lived 930 years. Seth lived 912 years. Enos lived 905 years. Canaan lived 910 years. Mahalalel lived 895 years. Jared lived 962 years. Enoch has a dichotomy. For Enoch lived on earth 365 years and has been living in heaven 5,360 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. Lamech lived 777 years. Noah lived 950 years. But Psalm 90 says the days of our years are three score and ten we got cut short we got abbreviated god cut us short from 9 30 9 10 9 50 9 69 to 70 maybe to 80 sometime 90 Only God can deal with the punctuation. You see, life has punctuation. And every now and then, God has to change the punctuation. Isaiah tells us about the enemy coming in. But some people don't know how to use the punctuation. For they put the comma in the wrong place. What you ought to do is put the comma after in. When the enemy comes in, comma, then like a flood, the spirit of the Lord lifts the standard against him. But you put the comma in the wrong place. You said the enemy comes in like a flood, comma, but God can flood the flood. God can flood the enemy. God can overtake the enemy. God can the enemy out. God can make him be a footstool. God can raise you up, make you the head and not the tail. I'm so glad God can change the 
punctuation for the chairman ask the question but the punctuation is wrong it is there any bomb in Gilead with a crooked question mark is there a physician there with a crooked question mark but when God changes the punctuation it's not is there no bomb is there is a bomb in Gilead exclamation point there is a physician there exclamation point sometimes you gotta take your questions beat the crook out of them beat the pin out of them straighten it out and exclaim be in my mouth in trouble I bless the Lord in the storm I bless the Lord in sickness I bless the Lord in poverty I bless the Lord keep on blessing him keep on praising him keep on lifting him up keep on giving him glory he'll change the punctuation and when he changes the punctuation my cup runs over when it changes the punctuation I get rivers of living water flowing out of my belly I'm not an abbreviation anymore like Jabez I'm tired of being abbreviated I want God to spell me out spell out my name spell out my blessing spell out my promises spell out my favor spell out my healing spell out my deliverance i am who god said i am i am blessed and highly favored i am above and not beneath i am the head and not behind god will I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. Angels in heaven sign my name. I know if anyone be in Christ, you are a new creature. All things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When God changes the I don't care if the doctor said die, God said live, 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 stop crying, stop holding your head down, stop being in a pretty party, live, pull your head back, square your shoulders, live, bring out your best suit, put on your best shoes, Live what you're waiting on. The Lord is blessing me right now. The Lord is keeping me right now. The Lord favors on me right now. Live, put a smile in your heart. If it gets in your heart, it'll get on your face. Put clapping in your hands. Put joy in your song. Put a little shout in your feet. Celebrate your life. Celebrate yourself. Celebrate your family. Celebrate your gifts. Celebrate your anointing. Live. say hallelujah 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 live if you gotta live celebrate you live if you got corns on your feet celebrate your corns if you got calluses on your hands celebrate your calluses if you got scars on your body celebrate your scars the stories is a reminder I could have been dead but God let me live 
Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.